Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com. Welcome to the Dennis Prager Show. I'm John Hinderocker from Powerline, filling in for Dennis today. And it's a big day. We are just four days out from the midterm elections. The, uh, the red tide is rising. That's what everybody seems to think. And it could be uh, an epical set of elections across the country. We should have a fun show today. We've got a number of, uh, of terrific guests. We're going to be focused primarily on the upcoming midterm elections. And, and as I talk to my conservative friends and I, and I read conservative uh, media and so forth around the country, everybody's getting more and more excited. And there's a certain irony, a certain irony to this in that we conservatives keep saying we don't trust the polls. And now we're saying, wow, look at the polls. We're doing really well. Our people are, our people are pulling ahead across the country. I actually think that's true. But I think one important thing to keep in mind is that we can't trust the polls. We can't take anything for granted, whether the polls uh, are giving us good news or bad news or something in between. It all depends on who turns out to vote. And so no matter how much we hear about the red wave or, or what reassurance we get from various pollsters, it all comes down to people on our side trudging to the polls on November 8th and making sure that we cast our ballot. So don't get cocky. Uh, don't be overconfident. Uh, and think about anything you can do, anything we can do, to add more legitimate votes to the total. If you've got an elderly friend or relative who may have a hard time getting to the polls so that you're not sure if he or she is actually going to make it to vote or not, uh, give them a lift. Or uh, depending on where you live, you can get a ballot and uh, and bring it to them. You know, the rules there vary from, from state to state. But one way or another, we need to make sure that we all turn out because the, the red wave is not even a trickle, not even a wavelet, unless and until millions and millions and millions of people across the country actually show up and turn out for conservative candidates. I think it's going to happen. I think we're going to be seeing a, uh, an election for the history books. I started predicting months ago that this was going to be a better election for Republicans and for conservative candidates than anybody was then predicting. And over the time that's gone by in the last several months, more and more people have come around to that that point of view. And I think part of the reason is, I'm going to test one of my uh, pet theories on, on the polls and the pollsters here and see if our listeners agree with me. I think that most polls are run by Democratic-leaning pollsters. And I think that there's something that they do, because we see it cycle after cycle. It's not just this year. We've seen it before. We've seen it a number of times. And the pattern, I think, is that early on in the polling cycle, uh, they oversample Democrats, and they do various things that pollsters can do to, to lean their polls one direction or another. And as a result, they get they get results that are favorable to the Democrats. And so you'll see a whole lot of news stories. Democrats likely to uh, hold House, uh, holds, increase their lead in the Senate, uh, that kind of thing. 
uh, Democratic governors uh, looking good across the country. Remember how early on the Democrats were talking about how they were going to give uh, Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott down in Texas a, a run for their money. They, 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 they were bringing Charlie Crist out of retirement to run against Ron DeSantis. And they were saying, oh, yeah, a lot of money is going to flow down there. It's going to be a close race. We think we think Chris can maybe knock off DeSantis. And in Texas, they've got Beto O'Rourke, of all people. They, they haul him out again. They run him against Greg Abbott. And, and they're doing polls, and they're saying, wow, this look, looks like close races in, in Florida and Texas. Marco Rubio, Marco is up for re-election in Florida, and they got someone named Val Demings running against him, apparently a former law enforcement officer. And, and early on, they're all optimistic about that. This is the year we can, we can defeat Marco Rubio. So this is the kind of talk we were hearing back last summer. Remember that? Well, that's all gone. That's all faded away. And uh, and nobody's talking about Beto O'Rourke beating Greg Abbott, and nobody's talking about uh, Charlie Crist beating Ron DeSantis, and and uh, and you know the happy talk for the Democrats tends to to fade over the course of the of the cycle, and what we're seeing now instead of that, we're not seeing money flowing into Florida or attention flowing into Florida. What we're seeing now is people like Barack Obama and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris going to states like Maryland and Oregon, where they never, never used to have to go, where they're trying to shore up Democratic candidates in states that that traditionally are really a a shoe in for them. So actions speak louder than words. And I think we're seeing actions around the country also in terms of where the money is flowing, where are the resources going now in these last weeks of the of the campaign, and we see that the battle is being fought not in red congressional districts, but in districts that Joe Biden carried by 5, 10, 12 points. That, that's where the battlegrounds now appear to be, and I base that on, on the fact that that's where both parties are now spending a lot of their resources. So, so here's my theory. My theory is that in, in a number of cycles, not just this one, the pollsters who, who mostly lean to the left, lean to the Democrats, uh, deliberately oversample Democrats and, and, you know, do whatever things they can do to make their polls lean one way or another early in the cycle. And they, they do that to discourage Republicans, to encourage Democrats, to try to frame the conversation about the election. There's all kinds of news stories that are predicated on those early polls, you know, tons of them. And and they really frame a lot of conversation about 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 the election that's that's now getting underway and they really frame the expectations that people have about the election and to a great extent they influence the resources that people are willing to put into the election and into specific races that are going on this year. And I think that's not unintentional. I mean, we, we've seen it more than once, and, and I think they do it on purpose. And then what tends to happen, and it's exactly what we're seeing this year, when you get down to the last couple of weeks before the election day, all of a sudden these same pollsters that have been turning out happy talk for the Democrats for the last three months start reporting uh, poll results that are that are very different. And... Uh, um, and, uh, and, and, and they now say, oh, this is really competitive, and, um, uh, and, and Republicans are now surging. Say, by the way, we have got uh, our first guest is Senator Tom Cotton, and I've just got a text saying he's been on hold here the whole time. Uh, so uh, I'm not seeing that on the board. Is there something we can do to bring him on here real quick? Hey, John, it's Tom Cotton here. Hi, Senator. Thanks for being on the program. Sorry for the little uh, little mix up there, Senator. Let's just jump right in. You have been touring around the country, I think, um, uh, and campaigning. Is that right? I have been, John, and uh, I heard your rundown of the races, and I don't disagree with anything you said. Uh, if anything, I think there's other races we're going to be competitive in. In fact, I'm about to take off for a West Coast swing where I'm going to be with Tiffany Smiley in Washington State, who's going to upset. 30-year career uh, incumbent Patty Murray and uh, Blake Masters in Arizona and uh, Adam Laxalt in Nevada later tonight and tomorrow. Since I'm going to be in Nevada in the spirit of Vegas, uh, I'll just say that uh, I think you should bet the over for both the House and the Senate. 
<laughs> and how much over in the Senate, Senator? Yeah, how many seats do you think the think GOP I'm is going to win? I, I have not yet heard a prediction uh, in the media in which I will not bet the over. So I'm very confident we're going to hold all 50 of our seats, and we've got a great chance to pick up uh, seats in six or even seven different states. Uh, as you said in your opening, John, the Democrats are telling you uh, what is happening in these races by where they're spending their money. Um, they're not spending their money trying to pick up a handful of Republican seats in districts that Joe Biden carried. They're picking up or trying to hold on to seats that Joe Biden carried by 20. I mean, I, w- I was in New York earlier this week for my book launch, John, and I watched the evening news and it was nothing but ads from House districts in New York, Connecticut and New Jersey that Joe Biden carried by 15 to 25 points. That gives you a sense of where uh, the closest spot races are. Senator, you are the author of a new book. Uh, We're going to come up against a hard break here. Can you stay with us through the break? I want to talk more about the election as well as about your book. Yeah, I can stay with you, John. Uh, Great. We will be right back after this. The Dennis Prager Show, live from the Relief Factor Pain-Free Studio. Hey, folks, coming together again after two years of waiting. I'm going on a listener cruise again. It's called Gems of Southeastern Europe. May 31 to June 13. 13 days combined land and cruise on AMA waterways. We are chartering our own ship for you and me. The cruise was just announced. It's already almost sold out. Book today at 800-345-2483 or click the banner on my website. Go to coastlinetravel.com. Again, everybody, we're chartering the entire boat. 800-345-2483. It will sell out. Or click the banner on my website. Or go to coastlinetravel.com. I call on you, my friend. Folks, this show is now available on TV, and I urge you to go there and watch it. Go to salemnewschannel.com or download the app. You can also watch us on Roku and Fire Stick. Salem News Channel, the antidote to the mainstream media. Welcome back to the Dennis Prager Show. We are talking with Senator Tom Cotton. Senators, you've been traveling around the country talking to voters. What, what are you hearing? How, how do you see what do you see the mood of the electorate at this point? The mood of the electorate is very disappointed uh, and alienated from Joe Biden and the Democrats' radical agenda. What I hear in Arkansas is what I hear all around the country. People cannot feed their families. If they can, they can't get baby formula for their kids. They can't afford to fill up their tank. They're worried about their kids' walking to and from school because of the crime wave across America. They're worried about what their kids are learning at school. They're fearful of the wide open southern border that 5 million illegal aliens have crossed since Joe Biden took office, flooding our communities with deadly drugs like fentanyl. That's why they're going to repudiate Joe Biden and the Democrats on Tuesday and put some checks and balances in place in Washington once again. You know, the Democrats spent the whole summer talking about abortion. Where I live here in Minnesota, it was unbelievable. You could not turn on a TV set without seeing one abortion ad from the Democrats after another. Did did that work for them at all? What do you think? No, John, it did not, in part because the Democrats have exposed themselves as total radicals on abortion. You've seen in debate after debate when supposed moderates like Mark Kelly and in Arizona and Tim Ryan in Ohio refuse to endorse any sort of restriction on abortion, even the most gruesome kinds of late-term partial birth abortion, using your tax dollars uh, to pay for it. Uh, So the Democrats have exposed themselves as the true radicals on abortion, while at the same time exposing themselves as indifferent to the priorities of voters. Voters are more worried about their own pocketbook and how they're going to make ends meet at the month and keeping their families safe than they are about abortion. 
The other thing that they've done more recently, you know, Joe Biden gave his dark Brandon speech with the red light and the shadowy Marines in the background. It completely bombed. And then they did it again the other night. What do you make of that? Um, Well, I think Joe Biden is just spoiling because he doesn't have any solution. Oops. I just lost uh, Senator Cotton. Oops. Can we get uh, the senator back? We've been talking with us. We've been talking with Senator Tom Cotton about his travels around the country, appearing and campaigning for various Republican uh, candidates and what he sees as the mood of the electorate and the concerns of the electorate. And uh, his call dropped off there, apparently, for some reason. So we are trying to uh, to get him back on the air. Any progress there? Okay. Still working on it. Okay. Uh, well, we'll see. Hopefully he'll call back in here in uh, in just a moment. Uh, and one of the things I want to talk to him about, if, if, he, if he does call back in here before the next break, is um, the new book that he has got out. And uh, we can maybe find out whether this is uh, the kind of a book that uh, presidential contenders like to write. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Senator Cotton has written uh, one or two other books uh, that were not in that category, so this one perhaps is not is not either. But his name is one that comes up when Republicans talk about people that we'd like to see running for the uh, for the Oval Office. So still no still no sign. Uh, not sure what happened there to uh, Senator Cotton's uh, telephone. I hope nothing catastrophic. Well, I think what we'll do is just is just go ahead. Then uh, we've got about five minutes here before the um, bef- about four minutes before the uh, before the break. And and one of the things I want to talk about as we as we go through this program is is how remarkable it is uh, how how out of ammunition the the Democrats are as they as they run for office here in. In 2022, I mean, I question whether there has ever been a party in power that had so little to talk about uh, when the election comes around. So what are the things that that voters really care about? Well, voters really care about inflation. And obviously, the government caused the inflation by pumping trillions of dollars into the economy that did not represent any incremental uh, growth in, in wealth. Uh, and so what do the Democrats have to say? Well, they blame it on oil companies, uh, as if oil companies all of a sudden realized in January of 2021, hey, all we got to do is raise our prices. And they blame it on Ukraine. But, of course, the records show that oil prices were rising substantially before Russia invaded Ukraine. So basically, they've, they've got nothing to say. Crime is the second issue that I think more people are concerned about than, than anything else. And here what we're seeing from the Democrats is deathbed conversions <laughs> after after a couple of years of talking about uh, defunding the police and and no bail so that criminals can be let right out of the street to commit more crimes and uh, and sympathy for rioters. We saw the, the Black Lives Matter slash Antifa riots that went on for the better part of a year, uh, largely condoned and sympathized with. Um, by the Democrats. Well, all of a sudden, they realize that they're in deep, deep trouble in the coming election. And one of the big reasons why is crime. Crime has skyrocketed across the country. And, 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 and nobody's in favor of crime unless you're a really hardcore leftist. And so now at the 11th hour, we're seeing some Democrats changing their tune and trying to be a, portray themselves as pro-law enforcement and, and, and so on. But I don't think it's fooling anybody. I think I think voters remember what's been happening over the last four years. They're not they're not happy about it. And then and then illegal immigration is is it is an issue that's on the mind of almost every voter, and certainly more so voters who live in border states and others that have been severely impacted by illegal immigration. But I think it's an issue for just about everybody. So where have the Democrats been on this issue? Well, nowhere. 
Nowhere. They are committed to an open border. That's their policy. The the illegal immigrants flow across. The potential terrorists flow across. The drugs, vast quantities of fentanyl flow across. And that is A-OK with the Democrats. That is their policy. Open borders are their policy. And when they talk about it, they, they, they talk about it in absurd ways, like like attacking border agents. Do you remember when those border agents on horseback were trying to apprehend some illegal immigrants? Uh, and, and, so, and so Joe Biden wasn't unhappy about the illegal immigration. He was unhappy about the agents and accused them of whipping the immigrants falsely but they've just is just it's another issue where they've just got absolutely nothing to say and then and then education is also a very important issue and underestimated issue the democrats have been trying to lock parents out of education while they inculcate kids with crt and gender confusion and so forth and the parents aren't going to stand for it. We're seeing this across the country, certainly in my home state of Minnesota, as in Virginia last year. So another issue where what the Democrats are selling, nobody wants to buy. We're going to go to a break, and we'll be back with Scott Jensen, candidate for governor of Minnesota. The Dennis Prager Show. History repeats itself, and we're seeing that play out with inflation. When Jimmy Carter took office in the late 70s, gold sold for $140 an ounce. By 1980, the price of gold topped out at $870 an ounce. If today's market performs like it did when Carter was in office, the price of gold could skyrocket from $1,800 an ounce to $9,300 an ounce. This is Dennis Prager for AmFed Coin and Bullion. Don't miss out on a great opportunity to purchase precious metals while the prices are still stable. If history repeats itself, we'll see a run on gold, silver, and platinum that will certainly drive up prices. Be smart and buy now, as I am. At AmFed, you're dealing with specialists who provide you with personalized attention, honest information, and sound advice. You'll never be pressured into buying outrageously priced so-called collectible coins or anything that you don't need. Take advantage of today's prices. AmFed Coin and Bullion, 800-221-7694. AmericanFederal.com, AmericanFederal.com. Welcome back to the Dennis Prager Show. I'm John Hinderocker from Powerline, filling in for today. And we are joined now by Dr. Scott Johnson, Republic, Republican nominee for governor in my home state of Minnesota. Dr. Jensen, thanks for being on the program. You're very welcome, John. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Scott, Minnesota has not really been on the national radar much in the current election cycle until recently, but all of a sudden I think people around the country are are realizing that we got something going on here. What what's been happening in your race for governor? I think for the last year and a half there's been an energy that's just been bubbling up. And it may not be readily apparent to people who don't live in the immediate vicinity or in the Midwest, but I think that the same kind of energy that drove Glenn Youngkin to victory in Virginia is happening in Minnesota. And it's born of moms and dads and grandparents. It's born of minorities that aren't buying the bill of goods that the liberals have been selling in the past. And it's, it's also being fueled by young people, people between 15 and 40 years of age that recognize that we're on a pathway that's not sustainable. I think the crime issue in Minnesota has really got intense enough whether you're talking about on the University of Minnesota campus, whether you're talking about the suburbs, the exurbs, the densely populated urban areas. But when you start to have to tabulate new statistics like carjackings, which in the past were not even counted, and you're up to over 750, Minnesotans recognize that there's a problem of major proportion. So I think the energy that Minnesotans are putting into this, this election is actually now demonstrating itself to the rest of the world, and the world is actually paying attention. So there's a national trend, I would say, uh, in that a lot of Democratic candidates uh, don't want to participate in debates, don't want to defend their records, don't want to go out and really talk to the people. You've been out there for the last, what, year and a half, meeting nonstop with Minnesotans, talking to them, and it seems like your opponent doesn't really want to engage. I think at the at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself a question as a candidate. Am I interested in having a transparent conversation with the voters, allowing the voters to 
if you will, contrast the candidates? Or do you want to hunker down in the basement, sort of like a, a Joe Biden playbook? I think Minnesotans recognize that Tim Walls has done everything he can to demonize his opponent. He's had the money to do it. He's trying to distract the voters and tell them that they shouldn't be concerned about crime and education and inflation as much as they should be concerned about this, that, or the other thing. That's his strategy. But I think at the end of the day, what's really fueling our campaign right now to the point where we're a half point up on the most recent Trafalgar poll is the fact that Tim Walls is disrespecting Minnesotans. He disrespected parents when he told them that their kids missed only 10 days of school. He disrespected the National Guard when he called them a bunch of 19-year-old cooks. He disrespected the cops when he let the third precinct burn, built the building burn down. He disrespected the state patrol when he told them to stand down and not protect state capital property. He disrespected the senior, frail, elderly by pipelining active COVID-19 into the facilities and then telling them that they had to die alone without the comfort of their loved ones. And I think now he's disrespecting Minnesotans by telling Minnesotans, you don't get to know the difference between Scott Jensen. You don't get to see Scott Jensen answering questions or Tim Walls defending why he did what he did. And I think that's what's really, if you will, getting underneath the uh, Minnesotans' um, skin. They're, they're just, they're edgy about it. Uh, they think this is not the way we should be electing our public servants, and we're not going to stand for it. And I think that's, that's added to the energy that was already accumulating over the past year and a half. Scott, we've got just about a minute or so left in this segment, and I hope we can uh, hold you over for another one. But um, Minnesota's had a tough four years. We had the George Floyd case and the riots. We have sky-high crime, COVID shutdowns, the damage to our economy and the schools, uh, inflation, the feeding our future scandal <laughs> unique to Minnesota. Are you seeing that reflected in the mood of the voters? I am. Um, I think people feel that Tim Walls has been absent. I think during the riots we had newscasters saying, where's our governor? I think during the waste fraud and cost overruns that we've seen, we've we've heard people say, where's our governor? We had hundreds of millions of dollars of daycare fraud, and Tim Walls allowed uh, that to pass and get swept under the rug without any accountability for the inspector general that arguably should have been able to be involved in that and detected earlier. In regards to the feeding our uh, future fraud, there were multiple opportunities for Tim Walls and his team to get involved and stop it, but literally he had paid out hundreds of millions of dollars after they already knew that there was likely fraud. He was absent then. Hey, we're up against a hard we're up against a hard break, Scott. Can can you stick with us for another segment? We'd love to have you. You all have helped build my pillow into the incredible company it is today and have trusted in Mike Lindell to give you a great night's sleep. On top of the special available to my listeners on the Percale and Giza Dream bed sheets, marked down as low as $29.98, Mike is now changing the game with his three piece towel set. This set is made with USA cotton, making it extremely absorbent yet still providing the soft feel you look for in a towel. This set comes with one bath, one hand towel, and one washcloth, typically retailing for $49.99. For a limited time, you can get this three-piece towel set for the low price of $19.98 with the promo code Prager. Don't miss out on these extraordinary offers. There's a limited supply, so be sure to order now. 800-761-6302. Use the promo code Prager or go to MyPillow.com. Click on the radio listener square and use the promo code Prager. Welcome back. We are talking with Dr. Scott Jensen, Republican candidate for governor in Minnesota. Scott, if you think back to the uh, COVID shutdowns of 2020 and 2021, I remember looking at poll data at that time. They're very frustrating to me because uh, incumbent Governor Tim Walls was polling well. Most people thought, well, you know, it's a crisis. They're doing what they have to do. And, and I think more recently, a lot of people have begun to understand the devastating impact of those shutdowns on our state's economy, on our small businesses, and above all, on our schools. We've seen a report now where only 36% of Minnesota 11th graders can do math at grade level. I mean, it's been a catastrophe. How, how are you seeing that issue uh, shaping up? I think Minnesota under Tim Wallace performed singularly poorly. I think that if you actually compare the data, 
to the rest of the country on the nation's report card, what you'll see is Minnesota was in the bottom half in terms of falling off. And we are indeed seeing so many of our students not being able to read at grade level, not being able to do uh, arithmetic to grade level. There might be an inclination on part of people to think, well, everybody got hit pretty hard by COVID. So, you know, we understand that. But that's actually not quite true. There are places that came through uh, the COVID uh, pandemic much better than Minnesota. And at the end of the day, I think we have to tie it back to policies put in place. Tim Walls locked kids out of school for a long time, parts of three school years. He locked down businesses and then went out and investigated them deeply while he wouldn't go out and investigate places that were presumably feeding 6,000 mouths a day in the Feeding Our Futures crowd. And people are wondering, what's that all about? I think people recognize that when Tim Walls was finding fault with natural immunity and what he was doing in the nursing homes, that was problematic. But for a lot of people that are in the know, John, I think when they saw the email stream between the Department of Health Commissioner and the Chief of Staff of Tim Walls looking for a way to blame the nursing home death rate on parents and kids participating in extracurricular activities. I think that was sort of the the bridge too far for them. And they said, this is just ethically wrong. So I think that a lot of people hold Tim Walls responsible for making uh, tyrannical decisions that didn't make sense. We already had the data coming in that this wasn't going to be helpful. It wasn't the thing to do, but Tim Walls just kept on doing it. We, we mentioned the schools just briefly there, Scott, but I want to follow up on that because because I think uh, over the last few months, most people have not been talking about education as an issue in these races in the way that inflation and crime, for example, are issues. But I think education has become a really important issue. We're seeing in, in Minnesota, as in Virginia and other states, the effort to shut parents out of involvement in, in the schools. Uh, we're seeing declining performance by the public schools. What what are you hearing from constituents? At every level, John, I think our school system in Minnesota is failing. Teachers don't feel safe in the classroom, and some 40% are leaving the profession within five years of going into it. Parents are being ca- called terrorists because they have concerns about what the curriculum consists of, and they think that critical race theory and hypersexualization of their kids should not be taking place. And yet when they get involved, oftentimes they're being told, hey, you're out of line. And so the parents are, are, are having uh, big struggles with this. And then you go to the kids, and the kids lost, in some situations, a full year of education. There's no mulligan. There's no do-over here. Uh, The kids are absolutely losing out. So when you look at what's happening with decreasing performance, increasing achievement gaps, and we're seeing that the kids hurt the most are the ones that could afford it the least. Oftentimes minority uh, community kids, kids that already had some disadvantages potentially, and it got worse. So I think people are recognizing that the way we're doing education right now is broken. And they're saying with almost one voice, we need to fund kids, not broken institutions. We can go with that old saying, a rising tide will raise all ships. We can make our public K-12 education system better by providing more choice for kids going into the school of their choice during their schooling years and then leaving school. We need to make sure they have a broad menu of opportunities as well. I think that's what people recognize has to happen. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the latest Thinking Minnesota poll. You've been busy. It just came out. But what it shows is a is a distressing loss of confidence in our institutions, both state and federal. It's just remarkable, the loss of confidence in everything from from the public schools to to the public health establishment. Something like thirty five percent say they have some confidence in in the public health establishment. Large majority do not. The, the regulatory agencies, we see it across the board. So if you get elected governor. Uh, what, what are you going to do to to uh, try to restore faith in our institutions? I think the heavy hand of government has been smothering people in everyday life at a rate like never before. And I think you're absolutely right, John. People have lost confidence. I think there's a tremendous amount of downside to this. People have talked about the public health uh, debacle in terms of the COVID pandemic. This is going to have large ramifications on parents' decisions downstream. Uh, We still struggle with mental health. We're not doing a very good job with that. 
uh, the rebuilding the trust in regards to public health is going to be a difficult task. But there are so many other institutions that people are also struggling with. And part of it is because these agencies or departments or governmental branches aren't really serving in a service mode. They're more serving in a heavy handed, expansive role. They're not, if you will, facilitative as much as they are punitive. People want the MPCA and the DNR and the Met Council uh, to serve and to help things get done. And in so often uh, situations, uh, people are seeing that they're really coming up against a a brick wall. And, And I think that in a Jensen administration, we clearly are going to be about making certain that our government branches and departments are going to be serving people in a consultative way, not, if you will, in a browbeating kind of punitive manner. Government serving the people. That's an old-fashioned concept, Scott. I hope you have the opportunity to put it into action. Thank you so much for being on the program. Well, John, it's a great, it's a privilege to be on. And if people want to learn more about us, drscottjensen.com is where they go. And I would just want to tell everybody, we need you fully engaged on November 8th. Nothing matters more than you exercising your right and obligation and responsibility to vote. The Fed is unstable. Interest rates could go up at any moment. If you're relocating and need to buy a new home or invest in real estate, get fully underwritten and approved with Andrew Del Rey and Todd Avakian at Sierra Pacific Mortgage before you make an offer. Their fast-track approval process will allow you to compete with cash offers, whether you're buying today, tomorrow, or a year from now. Even though housing prices are stabilizing or coming down, economic uncertainty, supply chain issues, and limited construction means the real estate market is limited and competitive. Go to andrewandtodd.com. That's andrewandtodd.com right now. Get fully approved today and have confidence so that when you're ready to buy, you'll have the money ready to go. Don't wait. Go to andrewandtodd.com. Lock in today's still historically low rates. Go to andrewandtodd.com. That's andrewandtodd.com. Welcome back to the Dennis Prager Show. I'm John Hinderocker from Powerline, filling in for Dennis today. If you are not familiar with uh, Powerline, you should check us out. Just Google Powerline, one word or two, and we come right up. The URL is powerlineblog.com. So we got a short segment here. I'd be happy to take a couple of calls. If you want to weigh in on the midterm elections, anything that's on your mind, uh, give us a call. The number is 18Prager776. 18Prager776. 776 and uh, if you want to get on the air we've got uh, we got a couple of minutes right now to make that happen. We're 4 days out from the uh, from the big midterm election which everybody expects to be pretty historic and that's been the main focus of our of our program today and it will continue to be. I want to talk just a little bit about some of the Senate races that have been in the news and and that people have been prognosticating. And uh, I want to pick up on something I wrote on Powerline a day or so ago, and and uh, and uh, it has to do with some of the some of the Senate races that are considered to be to be toss ups and predictions from Real Clear Politics, which aggregates polls, as you as you probably know. And and I want to just quickly walk through the races that they've got listed as toss ups because I don't think they are toss ups. At all. The first one is Pennsylvania. And I know the polls here continue to be very close. I just don't believe them. Uh, I don't think there is any way that uh, poor John Fetterman, what's been done to him is, is terrible in my opinion, but I don't think that there's any way that the voters of Pennsylvania are going to elect a man who is obviously impaired uh, to the U.S. Senate. Uh, it's just not going to happen. So I, I do not see that as a toss up race. Another one that's in that category, according to Real, Real Clear Politics, is Arizona. And, and it's, again, this is a very close race, except that Carrie Lake is going to win that race, her race for governor, in a landslide. We're going to have Seth Liebson on in a little while to talk about that. And I think that her margin of victory is going to help to provide Blake Masters with the extra point or two 
that he needs to get over the top against incumbent Mark Kelly. And I'm picking Blake Masters to win that race. Nevada, Adam uh, Laxalt has now pulled ahead of the incumbent, uh, Cortez Masto, in the polls. I think he's going to stay there. Uh, he's a very good candidate. She is a, a weak incumbent, and with the tide that we've seen around the country, I, I agree with uh, Tom Cotton, who we had on earlier. I think Laxalt is going to win that race. RCP lists Washington as a toss-up race. That's kind of amazing because here we're talking about Tiffany Smiley, the upset contender against uh, Patty Murray, who's a mediocrity, nevertheless should be should be a heavy favorite. So I see a lot of dominoes falling in the GOP direction in this race. And uh, stay tuned. We'll see what's going to happen. We'll be back with more after these messages. Welcome to the Dennis Prager Show. I'm John Hinderocker from Powerline, filling in for Dennis today. And we are joined now by the great Howie Carr. Howie, it's terrific to have you on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, John. Howie, I'm used to being your guest on your show, and it's really fun to switch uh, switch around. For those who may not be aware, uh, Howie is the big talk radio host in New England. He's got the big show out of uh, Boston, one of the great uh, talk radio people in the United States. So, Howie, it's, it's fun to have you with us. Howie, let me ask you this. You have been covering politics for a long time. What do you think of the current political moment that we're living in right now? I think this is going to be a pretty big election for Republicans. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, Trafalgar Group, uh, President Robert Cahaley, who I have on sometimes, and uh, you've seen him on Fox. He wears a bow tie. And he's he's really astute. And uh, he, he talks about it used to be the, uh, you know, they Spiro Agnew called it the silent majority. And then they called it hidden voters. And, and uh, Cahaley now says it's it's submerged voters. You know, you, you just... You can't get to people who vote Republican or in, in large measure because they just uh, they're just so fed up. And, they, and they're also concerned about the, the deep state for, for obvious reasons. You know, look what's happening with the FBI going after school board members, going after uh, people who sing uh, Christian hymns at abortion clinics. They, they arrest them, but they, they don't seem to have any interest in running down anybody who's uh, bombing these uh, pro, pro-life pro uh, health centers, including a couple in Massachusetts. And, you know, I, I think it's uh, I think it's just going to be a, a, a big wave election. And, and, and you know, you, you see it. I, I'm going to have uh, on Don Bolduck today in, uh, from New Hampshire on my show. And, and this is a guy he's been outspent by Maggie Hassan, just a, a real a real hacks hack. You know, just an, a total elitist, uh, just uh, never, never meets with voters, basically. He, she's she's outspent Don Bolduck, a retired general, 20 to 1. She's, she has 40 million bucks. He has 2 million bucks. And he's now ahead of her in the polls. Let's talk about about that. Howie. That's a race that was not on my radar at all. I don't think I'd ever heard of Don Bolduck until a couple of weeks ago. And uh, and here he is. Uh, that's now being rated as a toss up. He's even ahead. What what does that tell you? Well, I mean, it just tells you that, uh, you know, well, I think one thing in, in the Northeast, especially in New England and New York, I mean, there's this sort of hidden issue where it's hidden outside of uh, outside of the region. And that's the the cost of heating oil and uh, and kerosene and electricity and natural gas. And it's just crushing people. And they're getting all the everybody's getting bills and finding out it's costing them, you know, three, four times as much to fill their tanks uh, than as it did last year. And it's and and I don't think anybody who gets one of these notices from the electric company or or, uh, finds out they can't get uh, can't get heat, can't afford to fill their tanks or in many cases now. It, like kerosene is used by people in trailer trailer parks, you know, so it's 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 lower income people use kerosene they, in many places in New England and New York. You can't get kerosene anymore. They're rationing uh, 
home heating oil. And I mean, this is something, you know, the, the, the uh, mantra in the, uh, in these races, in the, in the cold weather, colder weather states, especially again in the Northeast is, you know, you're going to have to make a choice between heating and eating. And that's, that's not, you can't get more basic an issue than that, John. And it's, and anyone who's and worried about heating or eating, then I'd vote for Maggie Hassan. I'll tell you that in New Hampshire. And you know what? <laughs> oh, no, that's boy, right. In, in Vermont, He's he's even within striking distance against Peter Welch, this longtime hack congressman who's running to see the longtime hack senator, uh, Pat Leahy. You know, and, and meanwhile, the Democrats have nothing. They, they did the dark Brandon speech where Joe Biden is bathed in the red Nazi light with the shadowy Marines in the background. It bombed. Everybody criticized it. And then they did it again. He did another one with talking about, you know, our democracy. Does, is anybody buying that stuff? No, I don't. I don't think they are. I mean. And then, he, and then on top of everything else, he's, he's totally incoherent. He goes out and says, these election deniers won't accept the results from uh, 220 elections. 220? I mean, you know, sometimes he calls it 1920. <laughs> but this, last time at Union Station, he called them, uh, you know, uh, oh, my God, that 220. You know, and, and even, even like one of the late night hosts was saying, if you, you know, I, t- I used to take the train out of North Station, and you always have these crazy people at the tra- at train stations everywhere. You know, they're yelling and screaming, and they're up on a soapbox yelling about, uh, you know, Armageddon or something. And how was how was Joe Biden at Union Station? He's different than all those people we've seen our whole lives, yelling and screaming. <laughs> Well, I understood him to be saying that the Republicans might not accept the results of this med- midterm election, which is bizarre since everybody thinks Republicans are going to win. Makes me wonder, maybe his staff has not yet broken the bad news to him. Well, he also said, make sure you get out and vote on November 9th, which, you know, that's like a, that's like a joke, <laughs> you know, isn't it? When Republicans right. say something like that, they like say the you're trying joke. to suppress the voter turnout. Brandon's reading off of his off of his teleprompter or his note cards. He says November the ninth. How he when, when the mid I I feel like the Democrats have been just trying to hold it together until after the midterms, pretending Biden is okay, nothing to see here. What do you think things are going to change after the midterms? I mean, I think the Dems would like to ease Biden out. The problem is that that then they got Kamala. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what they can do. They they re- really uh, shot themselves uh, in the foot. Uh, you, you know, I was thinking about that today. You know, you're from Minnesota. I mean, if, if they had Amy Klobuchar, she's a, a horrible human being. But at least she can talk coherently and can sort of answer questions. Uh, and they would they would be OK if she had been the, uh, the the nominee, you know, or or if even Gretchen Whitmer, I guess he liked Gretchen Whitmer. I mean, another horrible human being. But, you know, she's somewhat presentable. But I, I don't know what they can do with Kamala Harris. I, I just I, I don't I don't know. And, and, you know, the other thing is, too, uh, John, you know, they say that the the, the uh, rank and file really likes Buttigieg because, you know, he's he's the flavor of the month. But uh, another different type of guy. But, you know, how. How palatable is he going to be as a candidate after, you know, that we're talking about having a diesel uh, diesel fuel shortage. So, you know, there could be all kinds of shortages right around the holiday season. There, there's talk, there's talk of a rail strike. Two of these unions won't agree. Every everything is going to be messed up, and it all comes down to transportation. They still can't get infant degree. formula. You know, <laughs> right. infant formula is still short, right? No, I think Pete Buttigieg is is uh, is totally overrated. Let me ask you this, Howie: Do you think we're going to see some really epic upsets this year? I mean, I think General Bolduc is in that category. Category, but you got people like Tiffany Smiley running against Patty Murray in Washington oh, or in Connecticut. Great. That would be you know, so great. Connecticut, it? yeah, yeah Connecticut, I mean Connecticut's I, I, your, your stopping ground. Yesterday, and uh, yeah, Leora Levy, she's she's hanging in there. She's being t- totally outspent. Uh, Blumenthal is dodging her. You know, even this guy uh, Pinion, I think his name is the black guy in New York that's running against Schumer. I mean, Schumer's gotten seventy-one percent the last two elections. And the, the poll I saw this week was he's running at fifty-four percent, fifty-four percent from seventy-one percent. 
We have. Well, and of course, we, talking about New York, have, Kathy Hochul's going to lose, right? Oh, she. It, it, I mean, it looks. I mean, every day there's another horrific crime out of New York City. You know, yesterday it was this uh, horrible right. rape by this guy who's been wanted for two rapes. The day before, it was somebody in Buffalo, Hochul's hometown getting uh, killed, uh, getting shot uh, the day by, uh, by her estranged husband in front of the kids the day after he gets uh, released from, from uh, a, a, uh, an assault rap that was live streamed on, uh, on social media. And Hochul says, it's the system. Hey, Kathy, you're the governor. You are the system, you know, and she, and she just throws up her, her, her hands. And, you know, in, in New England, John, we haven't had a Republican congressman for four years since uh, the guy in Maine, uh, Bruce Pollock, one was uh, screwed basically by the ranked choice voting. Even though he won the election, they took it away on ranked choice voting. Yeah. This year, Pollock one could win. Caroline Levitt, she's 25 in, uh, in, New, in New Hampshire in the Seacoast District. She is a, an amazing candidate. She's going to drive AOC crazy. You got Alan Fung, a Chinese American, former mayor of Cranston, Rhode Island. He's way ahead of. Uh, Ira Magaziner's boy. You remember Ira Magaziner, right? Yeah. John, one of the most I do hate. insufferable pablum. Hey, we're up against a hard break, Howie. I got I to gotta let you go. We're up against a hard break, but thanks so much for being on. My pleasure. Bye-bye. The Dennis Prager Show, live from the Relief Factor pain-free studio. Welcome back to the Dennis Prager Show. I'm John Hinderocker from Powerline, filling in for Dennis today. And we are joined now by my friend, Seth Liebson. For those who may not be aware, Seth is the big talk radio guy in Phoenix, Arizona. Seth, thanks so much for being on the program. John, it's a delight. You are a long time. I learned not to say old. You are a long time friend. It's a pleasure to be with you again. I'm used to being a guest on Seth's show, and so it's fun to uh, turn about and and have Seth as a guest uh, on this one. Seth, we've been talking about the midterm elections, uh, and and let's start with your home state of Arizona. Obviously, you've been uh, eye of the hurricane uh, in this cycle with, with two big races that have gotten a lot of national attention. Yeah, you bet they have, and they really are getting a lot of attention, and deservedly so. We are on the cusp of restoring Barry Goldwater's seat to a Republican with Blake Masters, the seat that uh, Mark Kelly is in right now. Uh, That has been getting better and better. The trend has been growing greater and greater for Blake. Um, As for the governor's race, uh, we're going to have a national star in Kerry Lake. I don't think anyone left, right, center thinks Kerry Lake isn't going to be the incumbent governor come January. She is amazingly good, Seth. I mean, I, I see her on video. Oh, my goodness. She could give Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis lessons in how to deal with the press. It is just a joy to watch her. She has harnessed conservative energy like few candidates I have seen before, like Ron DeSantis, like Trump, like Ronald Reagan. And then we start, you know, dwindling down and counting the names who harness it as well as she has she's done something else which is to my delight and i know your work your delight which uh she has been uh the republican candidate and soon to be the republican governor that isn't afraid of the press she holds routine and regular press conferences takes questions from anyone and everywhere and usually when the press thinks they have her on something it turns into a national expose of how bad the press is and how good she is she has just got the touch, John, and it starts with courage, as you know, the first uh, the first virtue from Aristotle. She's got it, and uh, she's got the brains, and it's it's going to be a delight to have her as governor. No, I think she's going to win big, and I've been saying that that I think her margin, her popularity, is going to pull Blake Masters across the finish line. Maybe give him the one or two point bump that he needs. Uh, does that make sense to you? Yeah, that is that is what it's looking like. Uh, they campaign a bunch together, not all the time, but a bunch. Um, I, I think I'm going to have Blake later on my show. I usually have him on on Fridays. He's in great spirits because, yeah, the momentum is going his way. Um, and, you know, with such a great spokesman on behalf of the conservative cause and the Republican Party as someone like Carrie Lake, 
um, people are, are, you know, thinking, okay, this is the party. This is the movement. This is the answer. And they see the R behind Blake Masters' name. Um, there's no question it, it, it's helping Blake Masters. It's also exposing something else, John, which is this fiction that Mark Kelly is some kind of a centrist or a moderate, speaking from Arizona. You know this. You've covered this a long time now. But whenever there's a debatable proposition in the Senate, John, or a debatable proposition about a change in the rules in the Senate, we're always asked, you know, well, can we get one or two Democrats to peel off? Can we get one or two Democrats to vote our way? One of them is in Arizona. It's never Mark Kelly. It's always Kirsten Cinema. No one ever asks which way Mark Kelly's going to vote. He's a straight D. He's a Biden Democrat. He's an AOC Democrat. Hey, one thing I meant to ask you, Seth, I want to I want to go back to Kerry Lake for, for just a moment. Sure. I, I've read that the Democrats actually promoted and supported her in the primary because they thought she was unelectable. Is that true? There might be some of that. I've seen those same reports. And, uh, you know, with the kind of the way the, the money sloshes around, there might there might be some of that. And if so, so much the better. Maybe even some of those people who spent some of that money will end up liking her policy. John, <laughs> you know, maybe so, but it is part of the longer tale that the uh, mainstream media here, which is almost all the media, uh, except uh, talk radio, as, as you would as you would know, um, almost all of them were uh, were anti Kerry Lake um, and uh, are continuing to be anti Kerry Lake. If the Democrats help put her there, so much sweeter and uh, so much better the victory. One of the big stories of this cycle has been the Hispanic swing to the GOP. I, I think we still may not understand how major that's going to be uh, by the time the ballots are counted after November 8. I, I think it's an earthquake. Are, are you seeing that in Arizona? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I give a lot of talks and have given a lot of talks for whatever reason. I'm not sure why, but for whatever reason, I end up giving a lot of talks on a few issues you know that are dear and near to my heart. You guys have been great on as well, specific issues in Hispanic churches or Latino churches. I get better reception there than, than regular events, John, uh, even regular conservative events. Um, regular callers to the show uh, from, the, uh, from the community that migrated here, yes, from Mexico, increasingly from Venezuela. You know what they say? They say we lost one country, we don't want to lose another. Um, so we're seeing a what? big, big part of that. Yeah, that's like the Cuban Americans. You know, they've been saying exactly. the same thing for exactly. a long time. Exactly yeah. the same so I wanna, exact thing. I want to ask you. I want to ask you, Seth, about one or two other races. So you are at least a Nevada adjacent, right? Yeah. Have you been following the Adam Laxalt uh, Senate yeah. Senate race there? How's that one shaping up? Yeah, I think Adam has this. I think Adam has this. He's a great, great, great candidate. Uh, smart as a whip. Um, an untold story that a lot of people don't know. Um, I don't think it's any kind of secret. He and Ron DeSantis happen to be exceedingly close friends, maybe even best of friends. So, you know, with this emerging Republican majority and this uh, emerging new face to the Republican Party, you got uh, Kerry Lake in Arizona, Ron DeSantis in Florida, hopefully, hopefully Adam Laxalt in Nevada, some other ones. My gosh, John, um, it's a good day to be a Republican. It's a good day to be an American. Yeah, that's for sure. Let me ask you about California. You guys are also uh, California adjacent, yeah. Yeah. and that is yeah. a bad thing to the extent that you yeah. attract refugees who don't always, yeah. you know, vote the way that they that they should. Is is there anything positive happening in California? I mean, is it just a complete wasteland, or are there signs of hope there too? I don't know. Your buddy and colleague Steve Hayward has a better read on it than I do. But he and I were talking the other day about, you know, the ballot propositions in California that would tend to you would tend to think of as conservative. They tend to do very well there and tend to win. One of the unwritten stories about 2020 is that California had a proposition to double down on the civil rights initiative that Ward Connerly started, you know, um, you know, applying the 1964 Civil Rights Act to education in California right. and public hiring, believe right. it or not, you know, judging along race neutral lines passed overwhelmingly in 2020. So, yeah. you know, maybe there are flickers of hope in California. 
Seth, we're going to bump up against a break here. Sure. Can I hold you over for one more segment? Honored to be. Honored. Terrific. We will be right back with Seth Liebson after these messages. The Dennis Prager Show. Welcome back to the Dennis Prager Show. We are talking with Seth Liebson, talk radio star of um, Phoenix, Arizona. Seth, when you look back over the history of this campaign, it's kind of amazing. I mean, the Democrats spent the entire summer talking about abortion. I don't think that did them any good. Do you? No, and, and and people are coming to realize the lie they were saying about abortion, which is, as you know, and have seen the, the way they've tried and screamed and blared this thing, that with Roe overturned, the Republicans, conservatives have outlawed abortion in America, which, of course, is a lie. Look, I think um, Peggy Noonan, actually, I don't say this sentence very often, Peggy Noonan had a really good column up online at Wall Street Journal today. This is about much bigger things. This is about Afghanistan. It's about illegal immigration. It's about the economy. It's about crime. It's about the shutdowns. It's about re-racializing our children. It's about sexualizing our children. There's a whole underbelly here that has left the Democrats with one last talking point, I guess. James Clyburn, the number three man in the House of Representatives, gave it to us this morning. Joe Biden gave it to us uh, well, really the last two weeks, which is if you vote for the Republican Party, you're voting to end democracy. Clyburn said we will be on track to repeat Nazi Germany of the 1930s. Let me just say, with a name like Seth Liebson on the Dennis Prager show, I'm looking forward to the Republicans (laughs) winning. (laughs) You know, I don't even understand it. I mean, that thing from Clyburn and Biden has said similar stuff. So we win the election and our democracy. What does that even mean? Are they claiming that we're going to like vote to cancel the 2024 election? I mean, it is so stupid. Yeah, that's right. But I do think when they tell you who they are, believe them. I think they're going to their version of a, of a purge. I think they want a one party state in this country, John. I, I'm just not shocked. I mean, the idea of marginalizing and an anathematizing 50 percent of the voting public, um, you know, uh, the, the anti-Trumpers in 2017 through 2020 kept saying, not my president. Uh, Joe Biden is looking to half the country and saying, not my countrymen. And um, I don't think yeah. it's going to work. I think it's terrible politics. I think it's dangerous. I think it plays on people's worst fears. I think it's a repeat of their warnings and alarms and excursions during COVID. When they tell you who they are, believe them. That's what I'm saying. Seth, I want to wrap up by asking you a bigger picture question. and It's been on my mind. I think Republicans are going to have a big year this year. I think it's mostly because the Democrats have gone so crazy that it's a reaction against the insanity, against the madness. And so in that sense, it's kind of predictable. But but yeah. the, but the concern in the back of my mind is it's it's great to have a good election, but it d- does it really mean that the voters are starting to understand and buy into conservative principles, or is our country going to continue the leftward drift, uh, drift only without some of the elements of craziness that the Democrats have tacked onto it? What do you think? It's a darn good question, John. Here's what I think: on Tuesday or Wednesday. We're going to see that um, Republicans sweep nationally. I think we're going to see that. But I think we're going to see that the votes were pretty darn close in most of the races. I think we're going to see one or two percent margins of victory that lead to the national uh, red tide or red wave, um, if you will, which I think is saying that the voters are giving the Republicans a chance. Uh, That's what I think it's saying. I think they're saying we can't handle this leftism anymore. It's way too much. Let's see what you got. Um, That's what I think it's going to say. And then I think um, I think that, uh, you know, leaders in the House like Jim Jordan, um, who will be committee chairs, people like that. It's going to be on them. It's going to be on them, just as it was on so many leaders after 94 and 2010 to prove uh, that the voters did the right thing. And hopefully we've learned some of the lessons uh, from 94 and 2010 so that we create uh, not just a 2022 red wave, but a 2024 and 26 and 28. I think we play it right. We will have an emerging Republican majority for years to come. I'm that optimistic if we play it right. 
Seth, that is very, very well put. And on that optimistic note, we're going to have to let you go. Thank you so much for being on the Dennis God bless Prager you Show. And your family, John. Bless you all. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to run to a break. We'll be joined when we return by Steve Hayward. Welcome back to the Dennis Prager Show. I'm John Hinderocker from Powerline, filling in for Dennis today, and we are joined now by my good friend Steve Hayward, also of Powerline. Steve, thanks for being on the program. Hi, John. How are you today? Doing great. Uh, and I've already mentioned to our listeners, I'll mention it one more time. If you are not yet reading Powerline, you should just Google Powerline or go to powerlineblog.com. So, Steve, I want to start out. We've been talking about the midterm elections, obviously, today. And and I want to just start out by uh, with this thought that that w- when when the polling began back in the summer, it wasn't looking bad for the Democrats. And some people were saying, oh, it looks like the Democrats can hold the House, hold the Senate, maybe maybe increase their lead uh, and so forth. And then uh, as the cycle goes on, that changes. And now in the last two weeks before the election, suddenly we're getting a lot more realistic polls and a lot more polls showing the Republicans doing much better. What, what do you think is going on there? Well, I think there are two or three things happening. One is I think uh, in the summer the polls were worse than usual. And by that, I mean uh, there was a startling article in, of all places, the New York Times a couple months ago by Nate Cohn, who's their polling expert. And what he said was is there's a crisis in polling right now. All of the polls were wrong in 2020, like they were wrong in 2016, almost all of them in the same direction. They were too Democratic. And he said, and he had evidence for this, that I think it's possible the polls this year – are even more erroneous in favor of Democrats. And like I say, he went through the reasons why. I think what's happened lately is a lot of pollsters understand this. I think public opinion has shifted, but I also think the polls, as they get close to Election Day, they know they need to be better. So I think they may be trying to be more honest about it, because if you're a pollster and you consistently get things wrong, you're not going to stay in the business very long. Now, there is one thing jumps out at me this week. It's the Wall Street Journal poll that showed that uh, women, suburban women voters have moved from Democrats to the Republicans in the last two months by 26 points, which is an enormous move, well, belong, uh, well beyond the margin of error in a poll, uh, beyond the margin of a, a fluke poll, I think. Uh, and I think um, I'm starting to call this the desperate housewives election. I think a lot of suburban women have woken up to especially what's going on in the schools. It's not showing up in the issue polls, but I think that the kind of reaction you saw among voters, swing voters in Virginia last year with Glenn Youngkin and other places, the school board recalls we've seen so many places in the country, including San Francisco, uh, shows that that's the sleeper issue that's driving a lot of this. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that, Steve. I mean, inflation and crime, I think, are seen as the big two. Illegal immigration, obviously, in many Mm -hmm. parts of the country, joins them as a big three. Um, But I think education is the one that a lot of people, including a lot of pollsters, are missing. Uh, One of the things that people have figured out is that the COVID shutdowns had catastrophic effects on our kids, not just the emotional impacts and so on, but on but on academic achievement. I mean, the test scores have just dropped off a cliff as a result of the school closures. And I think parents are really unhappy about it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's um, the reason why this is registering among women voters is that a dirty little secret of voter research uh, is that women voters tend to pay much more attention to local issues and vote more on local issues than men voters do. You're not supposed to say that. That's politically incorrect. But like I say, there's a lot of academic research that backs this up. And so I think what you're seeing is a lot of suburban moms uh, who are now paying attention now that their kids are back in school. They know what they missed from the COVID shutdowns, and they also don't like what they're being taught about how the country is whole, you know, critical race theory, and that you pick any gender you want starting in the kindergarten and the first grade. Uh, I think there's a healthy reaction against that going on right now. I think it's a triple whammy. You got the CRT, you got the gender craziness, yeah. and then you've got just the incompetent level of instruction. I know we're seeing it in Minnesota, and I think we're seeing it all across the country. And I think you're right that that we see it most with suburban women. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, the other group that you're seeing this, uh, and there's a whole lot of panic among Democrats, is Hispanic voters are shifting very rapidly to Republicans. And, you know, it's long been said that many Hispanics are culturally conservative, and I think that's true for a very large number of them, very enterprising people. Uh, and for years, again, I look at the data on this going back a decade or more, you found that um, even Hispanics who describe themselves as conservative in their religion or their culture or their outlook tended to lean Democratic. I think that was just a, you know, a historical pattern. And in the last couple of elections, they started to break very sharply to Republicans. Look, I mean, I think this is simple. Occam's razor. The Democratic Party has moved too far left in just about every way imaginable. And now it's costing them in one of their key constituencies. So let me ask this, Steve, uh, as a Californian, you know, even in New York, we're seeing uh, Kathy Hochul, I think, is going to lose. Is there anything good happening in California or is it just a a write off? Yeah, not very much. I mean, the Republican Party here is in really desperate shape. There are two things to watch for. Um, A very good guy named Lonnie Chen uh, is running for state controller. And that's that the state controller is just what it sounds like. The person who watches the money and watches the bureaucracy. And Republicans tend to do better, uh, or they often uh, turn in their strongest showing at that office. Haven't won now for a long time, but Lonnie's running a strong campaign, much stronger than the Republican nominee for governor, Brian Dolly, who's really run a terrible campaign. But Lonnie's up on TV with very good ads, and and he's gotten some newspaper endorsements, which is rare for Republicans. So keep your eye on him. And then the L.A. mayor's race, which pits a former Republican who turned Democratic because of the Democratic city, Rick Caruso, a real estate developer, pretty conservative, really, running against Karen Bass, um, uh, you know, a black member of Congress who's really pretty radical but is well thought of because she's smooth. And polls show that very close because I think, uh, uh, like in other parts of the country, uh, and the crime and homelessness problem in, in Los Angeles may be the worst in the whole country by the raw numbers, believe it or not. And so I think there's a chance Caruso may win, and that's going to be a political earthquake, I think, around the country. Well, I hope so. We're going to run to a break now. Steve, if you can stay with us for one more uh, short segment, that would be great. Sure. We will be back uh, for more with Steve Hayward after these messages. The Dennis Prager Show, live from the Relief Factor Pain-Free Studio. It's Prager Show. We're talking with Steve Hayward. Steve, we've been talking about the uh, midterm elections here, pretty much all all program. But I want to look ahead past 2022 and talk in this four-minute segment that we've got here about what we can expect over the next two years. Let's just assume that, that the Republicans do have a real good year in, in 2022. Where do you see the Democrats going? I mean, I think they would like to ease Joe Biden out. Uh, he's getting worse with every week that goes by, but... Can they do that with with Kamala waiting in the wings? Well, I think uh, there's a couple things to look for. You know, after the Democrats got killed in 1994, Bill Clinton, a very talented politician, much more talented than Joe Biden, was able to pivot to the center. Uh, I don't think Biden can do that. That's just because of the limits of his own talent, but because the Democratic Party has lurched so much further to the left than it was during the Clinton years. So I think what you'll see starting Wednesday morning is Bernie Sanders and AOC and the other progressive loudmouths are going to say, we lost this election because we weren't left enough. We didn't demand higher taxes on the rich. We didn't spend $4 trillion of of, uh, new programs. And that's why we lost. And that's what we need to do now. So in other words, they're going to do exactly the opposite of what Bill Clinton did. And the, 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 uh, the Biden question is in some ways irrelevant. I mean, I do think there's people are going to say he can't possibly win, although some will say, well, look, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama did. So why not stick with a guy? That's what the Biden people will say. Uh, so I think, you know, sit back, pop your popcorn if you can afford it in these inflationary times and watch the Democratic Party have a civil war that gets uh, even worse than it already is. So one thing we have to worry about is what happens to the economy after the midterms. And a lot of people are predicting a recession, which we haven't really seen yet. We had we had a little decline two quarters in a row when people debated, is that a real recession? But a lot of economists are saying in 2023, yes, we're going to have a a substantial recession. How how, how does that uh, affect the picture? Well, it's certainly not going to help the Democrats because they'll still control the White House and whoever 
has the White House gets the most blame. Uh, look, I mean, I think Europe is already in recession. Uh, I just looked at some data yesterday showing that manufacturing activity in Europe is falling off a cliff. It's actually descending to levels not seen since the 2008-2009 financial crash. A lot of that is related to their energy crisis and their energy stupidity. Uh, but some of it's the business cycle. Uh, China is still a big question mark. You know, their economy is half locked down and moving very slowly. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I, <laughs> the old joke is uh, economists have predicted, uh, uh, you know, 10 of the last five recessions. <laughs> but, boy, the planets sure look like they're lining up for some real rough, rough seas ahead. I think that's right. I think 2024 shapes up as a great year for Republicans, including the presidential race. However, that depends on who the nominee is. And if it's Donald Trump, all bets are off. We're up against a break here, Steve. Thanks so much for being with us. And we'll be back with more on The Dennis Prager Show. The Dennis Prager Show, live from the Relief Factor pain-free studio. Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com.